Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the International Society for the Pre Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect. We thank you for joining us today and appreciate all you're doing to help children during this challenging time. The 30th anniversary of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child provides an opportunity to reflect on whether the approaches to date in dealing with child abuse and neglect have been successful. Initial responsibility in most countries to address child abuse and neglect has been given to child protective services agencies. Recently, however, there have been calls for child protective services to take a public health approach in their practice. In today's webinar, Dr. Richard Krugman and Dr. Donald Bross will share highlights of their article from Child Abuse and Neglect called Health and Public Health Approach to Ending Child Abuse and Neglect, which discusses the potential positive and unintended problems that such a shift in approach entails. Right now, I have everyone on mute to avoid background noise. We welcome you to please enter any questions or comments in the questions box throughout the presentation. Dick and Don will respond to questions and comments as time permits. A recording of this webinar will be posted on the ISPCAN website for limited time after the webinar. Then it will be archived and made available for members only. Dr. Richard Krugman, one of the leading experts and scholars in the field of child abuse and neglect, is a pediatrician and distinguished professor at the Kemp Center for the Prevention and Treatment of Child Abuse and Neglect. He is the former director of the Kemp Center and served as both Dean and Vice Chancellor for Health Affairs at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. After retiring as Dean, Dr. Krugman co-founded ENDCAN with the goal of helping move child abuse from being seen solely as a social and legal issue to also a health, public health, and mental health issue. Donald C. Bross is Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics and Family Law at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He is also Director of Education and Legal Counsel at the Kemp Center and Co-Director of the State and Regional Team on Crimes Against Children. In his career, he has represented maltreated children in court, drafted child protection legislation, and established the National Association of Counsel for Children, all in an effort to advance the field of pediatric law. We thank you, Dick and Don, for being with us today. Um, before we begin the presentation, we would like to ask the audience a couple poll questions. So hold on one moment, please. Okay, on your screen, you should see a question in a moment about what region in the world you are from. If you could please choose the correct region and then we will share. Give a couple more seconds here. Okay, looks like everyone's about done. And can you see the results on the screen? Okay. okay, great. So it looks like uh, most of you are from North America. We also have representation from South America, Asia, Europe, and Africa. My apologies if your region is not on this list. It only allowed for five, five answers. So thank you for answering that. And now we'd like to ask another question. One moment. We'd like to know your discipline or area of expertise. So if you could please choose medicine, social work, psychology, law, or other. Again, we did not have more than five choices, unfortunately. <clears throat> okay. So it looks like most of you are in social work, um, followed by medicine, well, psych other, <laughs> psychology and law. So thank you for, the, for that. Now I'm curious about what the other includes. <laughs> and the last question is related to our topic today, a public health approach. Do you know what a public health approach to child abuse and neglect is? Please answer yes, no, or maybe not sure. Okay, and the winner there was maybe or not sure, followed by yes, and then 16% said no. Um, so that gives you, Dick and Don, an idea of a little bit about our audience. 
Um, so thank you to our presenters for being with us today. Um, Don, I think you're gonna begin. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, recognizing that some of you are probably watching at night or uh, inconvenient hours, we, we appreciate uh, your participation. Uh, when Dick and I wrote this article, we wanted to both endorse the idea that public health is a useful construct or framework for thinking about child protection. But at the same time, we wanted to uh, help people be thoughtful that about it not being a panacea, it's not the solution to everything. And in order for it to work, <clears throat> we think that it's really important to have uh, an understanding of uh, what public health can do, what it has done, but also that like every human intervention, there are limitations. So given that we are in the middle <clears throat> of a worldwide pandemic uh, and that it's very topical to talk about public health, there's a, a slide that came from a article in 2005 in the Journal of the Amer American Medical Association, which Heather's going to put up. And the title of the slide is Public Health Interventions, the 1917 to 18 Pandemic. And this is one way to kind of define what public health is about, which is to address problems that affect an entire population. <clears throat> I, I don't expect you to, we don't expect that you can read uh, what's there, but I'll explain what it's about. The, uh, there are four cities and there were 18 cities studied for, by the researchers looking back at the pandemic in the United States. The cities on the right, on the upper right is New York City. The lower right is uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And uh, you will notice that they had very high peaks of excess deaths. So the line across the bottom is baseline. And everything above that is a death that had it not been for the pandemic, it should not have occurred. What does it mean? It means that in today's New York City with a population of 8 million, there would have been over 36,000 people died in a year and a half only because of the 1917-18 pandemic. What's interesting is to compare, uh, and those two cities had very well-established public health agencies. On the left are smaller cities, but still cities of significant size. On the upper left is St. Louis, and the lower left is Denver you'll notice that it was a different pattern. And the result is under the curve, those cities had a much lower excess death rate. What happened was the smaller cities uh, used classic public health interventions. And these are sh shown on the next slide. Um, so Heather, if you'd go to that next slide, uh, just summarize them. They, they had, yes, they had mandatory measures. These included, this is Denver and St. Louis, school closures, public gathering bans, isolation and quarantine, staggered business hours. They sent messages throughout every source they could, including taking, having children take messages home. They put warning uh, uh, signs in theaters. And so what happened was that the cities uh, that used these measures cut the peak down, but they were so happy with the positive effects that they opened for business again, halfway through the pandemic. And so Heather, go back to that slide and you'll see that the problem was, oh, there it is on the left. All of a sudden, there it went again. And guess what? That's exactly what we're experiencing now. And it shows how no matter what system we design, politics and public pressures can affect attempts to create rational approaches to major societal problems. So uh, in a way, in at least the United States, the initial re identification and response to child maltreatment was a classic public health approach because Henry C. Henry Kemp was a noted virologist as well as a pediatrician who had been part of the eradication of smallpox. And once he and his colleagues had a diagnosis that was called the battered child syndrome, it was absolutely for them logical to then have laws to accumulate reports so that we could monitor the level and nature of the disease and, and determine if, if our efforts to reduce it were being effective. 
Yet today, <clears throat> despite that early public health framing of the problem, it is quite controversial in many parts of the world. So uh, here are some of the things that happen if we take a public health approach. Things like, believe it or not, it includes nutrition, education, and that education be general about hygiene, sanitation, safe and good food, uh, but it could also, as it's, it's been doing in the last 30 or 40 years, public health has been moving to address uh, violence prevention. It's, been, it's, a, it's a focus now such as that the Centers for Disease Control has a link that you can go to and look at uh, efforts to address and prevent violence. And, and it can make a difference. So in Colombia, which has had a half century history of terrible violence, hundreds of thousands of deaths, one group called Effecto started a national campaign to try to prevent violence, which apparently largely succeeded. And nobody hears about that Colombia having a terrible problem of violence anymore. Other examples are clearly vaccination campaigns. And we smallpox was eliminated by the combination of having a quick uh, diagnosis, having a potential vaccine, doing contact tracing, getting ahead of the outbreak, and vaccinating just those people who were most at risk. Uh, so we have reductions now of polio. And when it came to HIV, another illness where we didn't have <clears throat> a cure, all we had was classic public health, we did do contact tracing in order to get ahead of the virus and keep it from spreading further. Uh, other kinds of uh, care that apply to child protection include improved health during pregnancy, well child care, <clears throat> and in the area of reducing violence, we now have neighborhood safety campaigns, campaigns against spousal abuse, campaigns against human trafficking, kidnapping, and child sales, and child abuse and neglect within the family. And there's even a specific program to help us a community reform itself so that the community as a whole can commit itself to preventing child abuse and other forms of dysfunction within this uh, family. And uh, th this program is known as the Strong Communities Approach and psychologist Gary Melton and his wife have been proponents of this. So Dick, I wanna see now what your thoughts would be and then maybe if there are questions. Well, nice, Don. Uh, thanks to everyone who's there. I had sort of hoped that the 15 or 20 percent of you who said yes, you know what a public health approach to child protection is, might actually give this up. Uh, but my, I, I, I want to just go back a little in history. Uh, that's one of the things those of us who are along in years uh, can do. First, I. I may be mishearing, but for those of you who heard Don say that Henry Kemp was a urologist, he was actually a virologist. Uh, right, well, you, I, it's my hearing. Uh, and it, the interesting thing historically uh, is that uh, when Henry published that paper, uh, the approach to dealing with child abuse was really child welfare centered. Uh, and it was child welfare centered uh, rather than health centered for a variety of reasons. Number one, uh, there weren't many physicians interested in the battered child syndrome or in what Henry was talking about. When he presented his work in a three hour session at the American Academy of Pediatrics in 19. 61, a uh, 1,000 pediatricians were there, and at the end, uh, there were no questions. They all stood up and walked out silently, basically many of them saying to each other, not in my practice, uh, this doesn't happen here. Uh, he knew that if anything was going to take place, the public had to be involved and it had to be a national issue. And that's why he had a reporter from the Chicago Tribune at his three hour session. And so even though none of the thousand pediatricians were interested in talking about it afterward, the Chicago Tribune 
had a banner headline saying Banner Battered Children in America, and the whole field took off. Our role in health uh, since the 1960s has been primarily uh, to be among a group of professionals who deal with children of being mandatory reporters. Henry knew that uh, what he called the gaze aversion, G-A-Z-E aversion, uh, wanting to look away from this problem was rampant. And so uh, since the child welfare agencies in the US were predominantly helpful back in the 1960s, he and Brand Steele and their colleagues decided that if we just reported, uh, they and with the backup of the juvenile courts could help the situation. Fast forward about 20 years and uh, the system got a little bit out of control. Uh, it, some of you historically may be aware that in the 19, late 70s and 1980s, we rediscovered sexual abuse as an issue. Uh, rediscovered because it had obviously been around for centuries and had been described a hundred years and earlier uh, and even before that. But sexual abuse, unlike physical abuse and neglect, was clearly a criminal issue. And uh, as the U.S. Advisory Board on Child Abuse and Neglect uh, documented back in 1990, when our child protection system in the United States was really in a crisis. Uh, it was being beset uh, on all sides, uh, one side unhappy uh, because uh, studies showed that 30, 40, or 50 percent of the children who died of abuse had open cases with a Child Protective Services Agency. Uh, and at the uh, other end of the spectrum, there were groups that were trying to shut down child protection agencies uh, because uh, they were overreaching in their view. Uh, and uh, the contention really drove uh, from how incapably we were all dealing with the problem of protecting children from sexual abuse. So for the most of uh, the 1990s and since, most of the supportive services have had to be found in the United States, out in the community, and the role of most child protective services agencies has defaulted to primarily identification uh, and uh, assessing whether or not children have been abused or not, and then trying to provide services in communities uh, that, depending on the year, whether there was a recession or not, either could or could not provide it. Over the years, there's been a lot of cycling uh, in the United States uh, as one looks at the approach to child abuse. The initial hope, because Henry's paper said there might be as many as 749 battered children, was that we could just save the children by identifying them, finding them, and then putting them in a different situation, hopefully, as Henry did, treating uh, the families so the children could be back with them. Over the years, when it was clear that it wasn't 749 children, uh, it was millions, uh, the ability to actually provide services disappeared. Uh, the approach of putting children into foster care uh, automatically or getting them to a safe place uh, evaporated and policies swung back in the late 70s to trying to preserve families. And we have swung back and forth, uh, not uniformly as a nation, because we in fact have about 3,000 different approaches depending on what county you live in in the United States. Uh, as to whether we're trying to support and help families uh, and stop the abuse or whether we're trying to rescue children uh, and prosecute families for what they're doing. This hodgepodge uh, of approaches uh, is really one of the problems uh, that we faced. More recently, to get to the point of this uh, particular uh, session we're having. And we're going to ask you, by the way, 
uh, to begin to throw up questions uh, early on because we're not, the two of us aren't just going to talk at you until a quarter of the hour. Uh, we just as soon respond to questions in about three or four minutes and then come back, uh, stop that, and then come back and then do it again. Because talk, listening for 45 minutes uh, to two septuagenarians could be hazardous to your health. Um, but back, so if you have any questions, please start uh, putting them up or comments or undescended testimonials, whatever you're uh, in favor of. So the last five to 10 years, uh, the thought of public health approaches to child abuse and neglect uh, really bubbled up. Uh, the recent, the current occupants of the Administration of Children and Families uh, and the Children's Bureau, uh, Lynn Johnson and Jerry Milner, have uh, really led in many ways the effort uh, to try to take public health approaches to child prevention. A public health approach as I'm hearing them is really to try to prevent uh, children from uh, getting into or staying into in foster care. And of course, we know that prevention is primary, secondary, tertiary prevention. Uh, and what they're talking about is really not primary prevention. And we know that we can have primary prevention of physical and sexual abuse of children. But that's not what has come out of all of the policy discussions uh, of the last five to 10 years. The Casey family uh, programs uh, has done a wonderful job in pulling together uh, large groups of uh, people within the child welfare system nationally in the US uh, to have discussions and try to get people to accept uh, public health approaches uh, to them. What I heard in the halls at those meetings, uh, though, is that as has happened in the US school system, where teachers have been required to do more and more in addition to their teaching duties, trying to layer on public health approaches to an already burdened child welfare system in the United States uh, makes some people wonder, how can we do that? Now, the answer, of course, is uh, the approach, public health approaches take knowledge. And in the paper, uh, uh, Don uh, and I talk about the kinds of information, training, background, and skills that public health people uh, need. Sorry about that. And uh, the reality is, it's not just, it can't just be up to child welfare uh, to take a public health approach. We need to have the health system involved, the education system involved. Uh, we need to have clear understandings of what people's roles are. They need to be trained for what it is they're doing. Uh, and it can't just be one approach. So that's where we are right now in the uh, US. Uh, and I keep looking at this slide that shows the pandemic uh, maybe we ought to take that slide off because uh, I, it, it does look remarkably like what we've got now. Uh, and Don, you want to go to what the, uh, the the next piece is, or should we see if there are any questions? Uh, I think uh, questions, Dick. But I'd like to uh, use the uh, quotes that you and I thought useful uh, for Incan, that your foundation. Yeah. That is about the uh, that what Bill and Melinda Gates said about the uh, problems of uh, global health development and education, and uh, they said such problems can be roughly divided into three categories: 
Some require the exercise of ingenuity and discretion of small teams, for example, vaccines. Some demand the programmatic mobilization of legions of people, immunization drives. Others require both. And so uh, another way of saying, I think, what Dick and I are trying to communicate is, we, we really think it's important if you're going to use public health, not to make it just another slogan, because too often child protection has been slogan driven. And he gave examples, it's preserve the family, it's save children, avoid foster care and so forth. But that's not a public health approach. A public health approach says, let's understand the problem. Let's try interventions. Let's measure the effects and the failures of these interventions and then go to the next step of policy and practice. So um, the, to also point out that even though this was a celebration of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, we were also being a little bit curmudgeonly about that by suggesting that we really think it's a good idea, but we think it's mostly aspirational, meaning that it has nothing in its own terms about enforcement. And in public health, as we are finding in many countries, if you don't have public health laws that say, yes, we know you want to keep your bar open, but if you continue to do this and you become a hotspot, we're going to shut you down for a while. Right. And, and that is where we're trying to keep people away from false dichotomies of everything has got to be prevention, everything's got to be treatment. It's, it's got to be a combination of public-private. It's got to be a combination of uh, population and case-specific efforts. And that's the wonderful thing about public health is it's very broad, but in order for it to be powerful, it takes a lot of understanding. And uh, you, the, it's like the duck came down when you said uh, the UN convention. <coughs> We've had a lot of conversations uh, through the years and uh, those of us who've been abroad, and many people in this country uh, continue to castigate uh, the U.S. for not signing the convention, uh, and or did we now finally? But we haven't ratified it. No, we haven't signed. Uh, on the other hand, if you look over the 30 years, uh, the question I would ask the other uh, 100 or so other signers of it is, how effective has uh, signing that been in changing? Uh, your approach to children and families with regard to violence and abuse and neglect. The one thing that we don't have very well in this field is honestly, we have no idea uh, that the system we've put in place is actually helping children and families uh, on, over the long term. There is not a, the culture of looking at the quality of our practice and the outcomes uh, that other that a couple of other professions that I know of have done. Uh, let me let me expand on that a minute because I'm I'm not seeing any questions up there. Um, the first thirty years I was in pediatrics from 1970 three when I got my boards uh, until uh, just around 2000. I never made a mistake, ever. Uh, and I, I made no mistakes. And But if I did, by chance, then it was a conversation about that case that I had with our hospital lawyer, uh, where we talked about how uh, we were going to try to deal with the adverse legal effects of the error I made. What was interesting in those years from 1965 to, 19, to 1995, there was a, a whole cadre of professionals doing health services research who were studying the quality of care that physicians and nurses and others were providing in hospitals in the United States, presenting it, de-identifying de the data 
presenting it at their own professional meetings, publishing it in their own journals, and never feeding back what they had learned about the lack of quality. What they learned about the lack of quality in our uh, hospitals to those who were practicing. Finally, in about ni in 1998, 1999, Don Berwick uh, and the Institute of Medicine published a study called To Air is Human uh, <laughs> and began to talk about the quality chasm uh, and the gap between what we think we're doing and what we actually are doing. Now, airline pilots uh, and airline safety had been about 20 years ahead of us. Uh, they took that on directly, pointing out that the captain was not always right. Uh, and if someone sitting around the captain saw a mistake, uh, you damn well better talk about it. So um, since 1999, uh, the quality and outcomes movement in healthcare has not uh, uh, has reached the point where you can't get accredited as a hospital unless you have a quality and outcome system. They're published on the websites and you can't get home from a visit with a physician or a clinic and not have an email saying, how was that experience? Did you get all your questions answered? We have never done this in the child protection field and neither child welfare nor law enforcement nor the juvenile courts, nor the criminal courts uh, are at this point publishing or looking from my knowledge for any outcome data. And I was struck because last week we had a, we had a week long uh, training session here uh, at the Kemp Center. And uh, uh, there were a lot of presentations on big data sets uh, and there's a lot of work going on on uh, child, child protective services, looking at outcomes and connecting those sets that, but it's not coming back. And it's just like in healthcare uh, 40 years ago, where looking at the quality of child protective services is an academic theoretical exercise. And we need to bring that right down into uh, we need to bring it down into the child welfare agencies uh, who I think need to be getting regular feedback from the children and families, need to be publishing on websites what their outcomes are uh, so that they can get better. Uh, I see, uh, anyway, so that's, that's my diatribe uh, for the morning. And do we have any questions? We we do actually have some questions coming in. Yes, do you want to I just them? can't see them. Right. <laughs> so we can stop there and, and address some of these. Um, so I'm going to start off. We had a couple questions related, Dick, to what you said earlier about this hodgepodge of solutions. Um, one attendee is asking if you could elaborate on the reasons for that, and then others are asking if if there are examples of states or even uh, countries around the world that come closest, in your opinion, to an effective public health approach? <clears throat> hmm. Well, uh, one, one problem we have, as I said, is that we, we have a county-based or state-based approach in this country. So we are taking what I would call uh, the archipelago approach to landmass development. Uh, there are wonderful, wonderful counties, wonderful agencies, and wonderful places. And I suspect most of them are small uh, and in rural communities where people have to already know each other and have to work with each other. Uh, so there, there are examples of this. Uh, uh, there, I'm aware of places in uh, Colorado and in Tennessee and in others uh, where they have pulled together services and coordinated services. LA County, as large as it is, has been trying to do this for years through an interagency council on child abuse and neglect. But 
I, to me, public health approaches are, should be taken uh, by the health and public health system in collaboration with Child Protective Services. There are CPS agencies here in Colorado, Arapahoe County is one, uh, where they have nurses working with them. Uh, clearly, if you want to get into the prevention area, and Don has some slides on this uh, that we can get to later, uh, the Nurse Family Partnership and Public Health Nurse Home Visitation, which Henry Kemp actually kind of pioneered, not the public health nurse part, but the home visitation part back in the 1970s, uh, clearly can reduce physical abuse uh, of children. So, and, and I'm talking mostly the United States because my experience in studying the some of the European systems is that the European uh, social net, safety net, is a lot stronger than that in the US. And the existence of uh, a child welfare system and public welfare system that is actually supportive of families and respected by uh, the communities and used uh, collaboratively by the health system uh, is markedly different uh, than what we see in the US where because of because of now the uh, issues that have bubbled up over the years, it's harder and harder for most child welfare systems to be perceived of as being helpful in the United States. I'll try okay. to answer the next question or Don will with 10 words or less. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let's take, we have a couple questions here related to maybe persuading governments um, to make this a priority. One attendee is asking, um, what do you think it will take to get funders, government and other others to support primary prevention and any thoughts on how governments can be swayed to invest in prevention when they traditionally target funding for reactive services? Well, uh, you want to do that, Tom? I'll start, but if we use public health as an example of something that has been funded to do prevention for a long time, we'd have to also acknowledge uh, as a book by a woman by the name of Lori Crudson that came out about 20 years ago called Betrayal of Trust, documents that across the planet at that time, public health was suffering decreases in funding. So we have the conundrum that when we are successful at preventing things, support for that prevention drops. We also have the problem that children don't vote, can't buy doctors and lawyers and social workers, and uh, their persuasive powers are limited, <laughs> not, uh, because, not because they don't know what their needs are in a sense, but that people can't don't listen to them and they can't require people to listen to them. So there are structural problems with this. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't think, in my view, of institutional solutions, because that's all we've got. And there is this, that 200 years ago, the greatest drop in death and illness from infection stopped, uh, didn't stop, it fell dramatically in fact, more dramatically than any time in human history, because of what was called the hygienists or sanitarian movement, where a population as a whole, because of observation and report and study and the beginnings of medicine and the beginnings of public health said, look, if this smells bad, the water may be bad, maybe you shouldn't drink it. Maybe the sewage and the water should be separated. So in that sense, we shouldn't give up because our individual and institutional efforts are, there is some evidence, beginning to be felt. Uh, you could say the UN Convention is an example of that. It's not enforced, but at least it's aspirational and it says, hey, we've got a problem. But I just don't think that we can avoid th that this difficulty exists. It is the nature of human beings 
that if it's not broke, we're not going to fix it. So there are people who have thought creatively. One of them is um, uh, a colleague of Henry Kemp's, Ray Helfer. And in this country, he looked as he drove across interstate highways at how those highways got created. And he came up with the idea of a trust fund, a children's trust fund. And it has been used in this country to fund primary prevention of child abuse with greater or lesser effect, depending on the state. I'll go back to the question that Dick had, and then I'll stop. In my experience going across the world for, with this pan at different times, it's hard to point to any one nation that has this figured out. One, I don't think anybody has really got it totally figured out, but because her, is the, the, the question we started addressing implies, it's hard to maintain the efforts. So even when a country really gets good programs going, something comes along that if people find it easy to raid uh, efforts that are intended for children, whether it's schools or vaccinations or mental health or what have you. And that's just, we have to deal with this. If you need immediate gratification, you probably don't want to work in child abuse, but that doesn't mean it's not important. And I, I would add that uh, I just don't think that government leads. I think government, uh, our government, if we're lucky, follows. Uh, and what it follows is public opinion and public pressure. Uh, and the reality is, uh, and it's frankly why uh, at, for my sixth career, I decided to start a national foundation to try to end child abuse. It's because uh, I've watched the March of Dimes uh, eliminate polio in the United States because mothers got very worried uh, about their children swimming uh, in the 1950s. Uh, and every adult and pediatric disease has got in this country a, a national foundation that has supported research, training, uh, and prevention. Uh, there are hundreds of them. Uh, and the only health issue that I'm aware of that has never had one of these is child abuse. So we started it. Uh, and I, we're about 40 years behind. Uh, and I don't know that I have 40 years uh, left for this. But uh, the reality is until we're able to bring the millions of adults who were abused as children, survived it, many of whom are now thriving in our society, but have never talked about it because of the shame and the stigma. Until that group comes together, that's the advocacy group to push for the research, for the training, for the outcomes, uh, and for, uh, for us to be able to eliminate child abuse in our lifetime. Uh, but it's gotta come from the people, not from the government. So let me add something to what Dick is saying. A hundred years ago, women in this United States did not have the vote. Now they do. And every place we look around the planet where women are supported and empowered to raise children well, along with good husbands and fathers, things are looking better. So you may not have a perfect system in the world, but I think it's fair to say that unless women are empowered, the chances of having good preventive care during pregnancy and good child care and good education are reduced. So if you do this kind of work long enough, you look for your points of leverage. I completely agree with Dick. Sometimes you just have to go out and start from the bottom up. But if you're going to do that and if you're going to have the people involved, then we should recognize that women have been one of the secret reasons why we have progress in this field, because they're more willing sometimes to spend careers that aren't so well paid, but still matter a great deal, doing emotional work, not just physical or cognitive work, but emotional work. And once women are in charge, we can enfranchise children, uh, and children can have votes, either to be voted on by themselves when they're old enough to do it, uh, or uh, by their parents on behalf of them. And if you suddenly enfranchised 30% of the, 
of our population that is disenfranchised in this country, namely its children, you would see that the politicians' priorities would change. Dick and I uh, talked about this, and he, we talked about this in 1981, and Dick right. said children should have the vote, and I thought that was ridiculous. But five minutes later, I came back and said, you know, Dick, it, shouldn't parents have a right to vote for each child until the child can vote for Absolutely. himself or herself? <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. We have so many great questions. I'm not sure where to go next. Um, we, we have a question here from someone um, who says several states in the U.S. are now declaring racism a public health issue. And she's wondering how this might impact your approach or would it be factored in? Well, public health does not only attend to that, but not always well. The article that uh, we published has a reference to how public health can also discriminate. All you've got to do in this country or in biomedical research is term Tuskegee. And uh, for those of you who may not know about this, this was a time when syphilis had no cure and a group of uh, African-American men in southern parts of the United States were had research conducted on the, quotes natural history of syphilis. And even though uh, penicillin came along, it wasn't given to these men because it would have interfered with the study of what would happen to them if they didn't get the vaccine. So, um, the first answer is, is racism a problem? The second answer, and the answer to that is yes. The second uh, question is, does public health do it better? Well, to the extent, extent that it's scientifically oriented, yes, because it recognizes that poverty and race have a tremendous uh, influence as a cofactor in people's well-being and health. And, but it's again, making sure that that information is out there that speaks for itself. And just an editorial comment unpaid is that as a lawyer for children, I always felt that the best kind of evidence that I could produce either in court or in a legislature was what in Latin is known as res ipsa loquitur, meaning the thing speaks for itself. And the more information we have about children's health or lack of health and all of the contributing factors, including race, ethnicity, religion, region, the better our chances of when we have somebody's attention, making sure that we have a fully informed, responsive policy. Yeah, you know, I, I, well, I think we should go on to to another question. I I I think a public health approach uh, toward racism implies that we take a population approach. Uh, to trying to eradicate what's a serious issue. Uh, that's different from uh, and complementary to taking on a one-on-one -on -one approach uh, to dealing with individuals whose behavior is racist, uh, who parenthetically may never have realized it because of where they grew up or how they grew up, but can learn how not to be racist. Uh, and then you have to deal separately uh, with those who are purely racist as individuals, and you need to either marginalize them or compartmentalize them or move them out. Okay, thank you. Um, so shifting gears a bit here, we, we have a couple questions around community-based approaches. Um, one person was asking, how is a public health approach different from community-based modules of child protection? And then another attendee was asking or, or commenting that currently the discourse around abolition of child protective services with a focus more on investing in, investing in community service and support is coming to the forefront. And given the history you've shared, do you have any thoughts on how this discourse might impact child protection services and ultimately your approach? We, we've got to have multiple approaches. We can't, and we ought to house these approaches in the appropriate places. We, it, I, I'm sure this audience is familiar with uh, David Olds's work and Prevent Child Abuse America's work with healthy families. 
uh, and how home visiting can prevent abuse. Some people can talk about as a, that as a public health approach. I, my own view is that those things work and they ought to be a basic part of what we do in the health system. Um, I, I just don't, uh, I, I think we need to get everyone engaged. Uh, the education system has a huge role uh, to play, but it ought to play it within the confines of its system uh, rather than rather than asking one agency to do it. And, and we can't abolish a single, we can't abolish child protective services, just as I, in my view, we can't abolish the police. We can refocus, we can have people working with each other so that the goals of each of those agencies can be met in a way that gives the community what it needs. Uh, we only get in trouble when we ask a single entity or a single agency or a single person to solve all our problems for us. You don't want police punishing parents because they didn't understand how to care for their child. But if you're going to deal with sex trafficking, tell me how you're going to deal with it if you don't have law enforcement. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, there are a couple questions around neglect and psychological abuse. Um, one person is asking, how should attention to psychological abuse and neglect be factored in? And another person is saying, um, just a second. She says, we know that child morbidity and mortality results from neglect more than abuse, that discussing violence Violent in intervention, violence and in interventions can sometimes become entangled in politics and that many risk factors for neglect are also risk factors for abuse. Perhaps a focus on preventing neglect may be a way to maintain public support and simultaneously reduce violence. Any thoughts there? I, well, I have a Yeah. Go, Go ahead. ahead. No, I mean, that well, was one of our disruption papers. So public health, it does deal with issues of what's missing, if you will, in an environment. So that's why we have vitamins added to certain foods. And uh, we have uh, the presence of something that is neglectful because of its presence, i.e. lead in the water system. So it's not as if public health isn't a relevant application, but what it implies is you've got to show what the absence is that you're needing to make up. And psychological abuse and neglect has always been hard to show, but now that we have functional MRI in other ways, there's actually research done by, um, uh, I'm trying to remember his name, but he does use his functional MRI at uh, Harvard Mass General's uh, psychiatric uh, facility to show that there is a continuing impact in the brain of verbal abuse, witnessing domestic violence, and similar kinds of traumatic events. As we do more research, I think we're gonna be able to find ways to show that neglect is powerfully important. At the same time, the power of working with children in preventive ways is demonstrated by the Olds Nurse Family Partnership, which in Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, maybe we could go to those slides quickly and I can we can skip ahead and we let's see if I can. Minutes. I know we're going to run out of time, but let's, let's just go down to uh, let's go to slide. Uh, go to slide number uh, nine. OK, so speaking of neglect, this is a population of all African, mostly African-American mothers and their children. And it was the second of the three major field experiments that David Olds conducted. And what he found was that if the mother was not provided a nurse in that community, her child by the age of nine was four and a half times more likely to be dead. That's the red bar. Go to the next slide. So even though infant and childhood mortality are uncommon events by age nine, these children 
were much more likely to have died. And it wasn't all because they'd been physically abused. They were dying of neglectful things. So this is where public health is helpful and real science is helpful. Because what David also found was even though this very valuable service was offered, one in four or one in five of the women refused that service. So it's why it takes an enormous effort to apply good science to the issues we're discussing. But has, and as Des Runyon has shown, uh, and others, uh, for, or, or others have shown, I don't remember who showed it, but I know he's talked about it. For, for every dollar increase in the minimum wage, neglect drops by 10 to 13 percent. So again, neglect, it, it's a huge issue. It is where social services and child welfare and the government have a big role to play. It's tied up with racism. And I think physical abuse and much of sexual abuse uh, might even be handled best with a health and public health approach and leave the biggest issue, uh, which is neglect, uh, to a separate approach. Emotional abuse and neglect is probably the most prevalent thing. And for 40 years, we've never, I've never given a talk where somebody hasn't come up at the end and said, when are you going to deal with what really hurts people? And that's emotional abuse and psychological abuse. And that's where we need the adult survivors to come forward because they've never talked about it. And unless we take a public health approach to that, advertising and giving people the understanding that the denigration of a, a child's, uh, the denigration of a child and the erosion of their self-esteem uh, is among the most serious things we can do, we're gonna have problems. We're at 957. We're running out of time, but I want to add the point that in the old study, none of the women who got visited by a nurse was given a dollar. So we can't throw away factors. Poverty Thanks. matters, race matters, but it also matters how children are cared for independently of those things. And that's why public health is a valuable model to us because it requires us to think about all of the factors that could make a difference and try to tease out how to address them both individually and collectively. And I've got two last slides just to leave people with an impression. With all of this institutional thinking, it still comes down to one child at a time. So if you go to that next slide, Dick, this you probably haven't seen. I remember this is, that slide. This is a child that was seen by us individually. And this was a child who was neglected. But if you look at the I mean, this is this is a child who could have been in one of the countries where people were starving to death every day, and this was in a very well-to-do country in a very well-to-do city, and this child was found in this condition, and was brought to the hospital. And look at the last slide, because uh, intervention does matter. So this need to foster caring has to happen, and public health tells us at all of these levels. Broadly and individually, it's still going to come down to finding a way to see that each child receives what she or he needs. The time of the gentleman has, both of them, has expired. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Dick and Don, for sharing all of this really insightful information with us today. Um, we unfortunately have not gotten to all of the great questions that the audience has, has asked. Mouth. Yes, so I wanted the audience to know that that we will definitely be getting these questions to the presenters and hopefully we can get those answered for you. Um, we really appreciate it. And so Heather, just to, yes. I'd want, I, I did send you a copy of the article just in case somebody wants to write you and ask for it. Great, Ooh, thank you so much. Violated, violated okay. copyright law. <laughs> well, but it's only for the purpose of education. Oh, yeah, for the purpose of education, it's okay. Yes, and we did get the okay from Elsevier that we can share um, preprint versions of the of the article. So I think we're good there. So I just right. wanted to conclude um, by again thanking everyone for joining us today. And if uh, if you're not a member of ISPCAN, we encourage you to become one so that we can continue having webinars like these in the future. 
And our member benefits, you can see here, include a subscription to our monthly research journal, Child Abuse and Neglect, as well as access to our past webinars and other educational resources, our ISPCAN child abuse screening tools, and discounts to our Congresses, which we are planning to resume in 2021. We offer several membership levels, including our new associate membership, which is $35 a year. And we also invite you to uh, visit ISPCAN's COVID-19 resources page for a variety of resources for professionals, parents, and children. And here you'll also find information on our upcoming webinars. And finally, to learn more about ISPCAN, please visit us at ISPCAN.org. And a reminder that a recording of today's webinar will be posted on our website shortly. If you have any questions or comments about today's webinar or upcoming webinars, please contact us at resources at ISPCAN.org. Thank you all again for joining us today. We hope you stay safe and healthy and have a great day or night wherever you are. Thanks so much, Dick and Don. You're welcome. Stay good night, Dick. Okay, bye-bye everyone.